Welcome to our Truth to Live By podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. In this podcast, you will hear the verse-by-verse teaching and preaching of Pastor Kevin O'Connor. For more information about our church, and if you'd like to donate to this ministry, go to our website at windwardbaptist.org. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. In this passage, John is in the throne room in heaven, and he sees a scroll that is sealed with seven seals. Who is worthy to open the seven-sealed scroll? A search is made in heaven and earth, and no one was found worthy. Then an elder says to John, remember the 24 elders? Behold the Lamb. The Lamb is worthy to open the scroll. And so we know that that's Jesus Christ. And this chapter lifts up and exalts Jesus Christ. It says in verse 1, And I, of course this is John, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. So now he says book, and we would think book like how we have a book. When he's talking about a book, it's not this type of book. It's a scroll. And in those days, they didn't have books like this, so they had scrolls. And the scroll that he's talking about here is basically the title deed to the earth. A title deed was very important because, you know, on a title deed, that spoke of land, which is obviously very valuable. A scroll was uh, written on papyrus, which was kind of like brown paper, kind of like what you would use for a, a brown paper bag. The scroll was held in the left hand and unrolled with the right. And as the reading went on, the previously read portion was re-rolled. And on such a typical scroll, this type of scroll, if you had a scroll of the book of Revelation, it'd be 15 feet long. So that's how if you brought the book of Revelation, you'd have a big scroll. So in Jewish history, there was a type of document that was written on both sides. So... Now you have how it says here in verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side. So that's both sides. So the information of what's contained in the scroll is written on one side, but on the other side was going to be information because this is a title deed. So in this scroll, a lot of people believe, and it makes a lot of sense, that this is some type of title deed. Some people say it's like a last will and testament, but I don't think that's what it is. In Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 6 through 9, we read about something. Let's say if someone had a property and then they lost it. Now, we know that if you've heard of the, like the story of Ruth, you have the kinsman redeemer, and the kinsman redeemer could purchase a property back for a relative that lost it the nearest of kin, the kinsman, and he would redeem, he would buy it back. So you could do that for land. So if someone mortgaged their property, in Israel, the Jews had it set up, or actually God had it set up, where they wouldn't lose land. Kind of wish they would have done that in, in Hawaii, yeah? <laughs> so that the family, the, the, the land wouldn't be lost to the family. So if someone had a, a property and then they would mortgage it, or they they weren't able to pay it. Let's say they lost their job, you know, through COVID or something, or some unforeseen circumstance. Rather than losing the land, they would mortgage it, or they'd put it up for, you know, for a mortgage. It kind of reminds me of when you play Monopoly. You know, you have to pay, and then you have to mortgage your property, and you have to turn it in on the, you turn it around, right? And then you know, it's worth so much or whatever. How There's like information on there that you have to pay this or do that to get the property back into your name. Well, how they did it in Israel, that property was a title deed and it would be sealed. And then there'd be information on the backside about how much the person owed or why it was forfeited for that time period. And they had seven years to get it back. Now, we know that the way it was set up in Israel after seven years, all the pro- or after the year of Jubilee, which was 50, every 50 years, all the land would go back to the rightful 
owner. God was always trying to get the land back to the rightful person. But a kinsman redeemer could purchase that property back for the person that owns it. And that was what he would do. So in this passage of scripture, God has Jeremiah to, to do this. So we see an example of this as far as how title deeds or how property was dealt with in Israel. You see on the, right there in Jeremiah 32, verse 6 through 9. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, By, thy, by thee my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine. You're a near kinsman. It's your right to do this. So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, By my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord, and I bought the field of Hanamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver, to redeem or to buy the land back. Now, not just anyone could do that. You had to have the right to, to do it. It had to be your right. You had, to, you had to be willing and able to redeem it. And so we, if you remember the story of Ruth on how Boaz was the kinsman redeemer for Ruth, and he purchased not just a, a land, a, a piece of property, but also he purchased uh, her as a wife of his near relative who had died. So the, the kinsman redeemer would do this when it came to a piece of property. So a legal document, the way it was handled was when someone could not pay the, um, the price, that title deed was not sealed with just one seal, it was sealed with seven seals. And so when they would unroll it, you would see on the back side of the, of the document the conditions that they had to uh, meet and what they had to do in order to pay it. So, you know, you might say, well, this is what had happened and this is what you have to do. And the, and the seals would be opened up and then you could see the conditions and then those conditions had to be made. So now in this situation, we see that this title deed or this scroll is a title deed to the earth. The title deed to the earth was initially given to who? To Adam. So Adam was, was given that, and as God said, to have dominion over the earth, to subdue it, to cultivate it. He told him that you are in charge, and he had to name the animals. And he was the one who had, as the Bible says, he had to dress it and keep it. And, then th and that meant to guard it and to make it produce. You are in charge, Adam. The title deed was given to him. But Adam did not obey the Lord. And he had basically one command, not to eat of the fruit in the midst of the garden. In the day that you eat thereof, God said, you will surely die. And so Adam eats of the forbidden fruit, and he forfeits the title deed. So now the title deed is in the, the devil basically has it, has the title deed to the earth. So if you think about all the things that happen on this earth, and if you think back, even in the story of Job, the, the way that the devil was able to control the weather in the story of Job, we don't know how everything works out, but the devil has some sort of control in this world and the Bible even refers to him as the God of this world. And the Bible also refers to the devil as the prince and the power of the air. And in Matthew chapter 4, when the devil took Jesus to the top of, a, a, of the mountain in the temple and he tempted him told it to turn the stones into bread, Jesus never refuted him when he offered him the kingdoms of the world. Look at, and on your notes, it's in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. And again, the devil taketh, taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Jesus didn't say, you don't have the right to offer me that, devil. He didn't say that. He said, 
Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He didn't refute the devil when the devil uh, made that deal with him. So that tells us that the, the title deed, there's some sort of control that the devil has over this world because when Adam sinned, what happened? Sin and death was passed upon to every person. And the Bible says in Romans 5.12, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And when Jesus was talking to the religious leaders, he, he told them something very interesting. He said, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, abode not in the truth. There is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And he says that that is your father. So because people are born into this world sinners, so they are basically the descendants of, because they're influenced by, because they end up sinning, and of course, the devil sinned. He was cast out of heaven. So the devil is the father of all those that are born into this world naturally. Now, when we become born again, now we are what? We are born into God's family. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Because before you're born again, the devil is your father, who is the prince of the power of the air. So... That is the reason why Jesus said this, or it says in, in the Bible, in First John, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, because the world system is of the devil. That's why it says in the book of James, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is at enmity with God. Whosoever therefore is a friend of the world is the what? Is the enemy of God. Now, he's not talking about the planet. He's talking about the, the world system. The system of the world is the devil's domain. And look at what it says in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. He blinds the minds of those that don't believe. Those that, never, those that are not saved, their mind is blinded. Ever wonder why someone just doesn't automatically just get saved? I mean, it's such a good deal. I mean, we get everything for nothing. He paid the price for everything. He died on the cross for our sins. We give him our sin, he gives us his righteousness. I mean, that is the greatest deal ever. You know, e eternal life is a free gift. You know, the, Bi the Bible says in um, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we, the sinners, might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. That's a great deal. Why doesn't someone want to get saved? Because they're blinded. And we know in this world there's a lot of deceit. And those that believe in evolution, those that believe in aliens, those that, be I mean, people believe in stuff. It's like, well, I just can't believe in things I can't see. But people are all the time believing in things we can't see. We put our trust, pe people put their trust in the media, they put their trust in so called science, they put their trust, I mean, we got to put our, put our trust in other people just, what, just when we drive down the street. <laughs> we don't know who that person is driving. I mean, what if they cross the center? I mean, but to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, some people just refuse to do it. Why? They're blinded. And so that's what the devil does. This is the devil's world. You know, people think, why is the world the way it is? Because we live in a sin-cursed world. It's under a curse. So in this chapter is the pivotal chapter where we see, you, you, ever, you ever ask yourself or think, why does, the, why does the Lord allow this to continue on? People have been asking that for years. We may have asked that. How long? We see in Revelation, they're going to be asking, how long, oh Lord? How long are you going to let this go? How long are you going to allow people to curse your name? How long are you going to allow this to go on? Where it seems like sin and sinners are, they're continuing to prosper. And yet the righteous suffer. How long? This chapter speaks of the time where that's it. The time is done. Where now, here you have the title deed. The title deed to the earth. And it's about to be redeemed. 
But there's only one kinsman redeemer. There's only one that's worthy. There's only one that is able and willing and what says here, worthy to redeem the earth. <laughs> and there's going to be a search made. So this is, seems to be a title deed. The world that we live in now, and a lot of people blame God, but this is a world, once Adam sinned, sin entered into this world, and now this is the devil's world in that sense. Now, yes, God is sovereign and he rules over all, but because there's sin in this world, God has given man a free choice. We are free moral agents. Adam had that choice to sin and he chose to sin. You and I are sinners by nature, by choice, and by practice, there is no hope for us in and of ourself. And there's no hope for this world outside of the one who is a worthy. So we see that in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel sees this scroll. In Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. This is on your notes too if you turn a page. When I looked, behold, in hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. So because it was written within and without, we know that this must be a title deed. And there was written therein, lamentations, mourning, and woe. Now, the title deed to the earth, if you think about this title deed, you're thinking about how the earth was that God created, how beautiful it was, the Garden of Eden, and the perfect climate. In fact, they lived, I mean, read, the, read Genesis chapter 5 and see how long they lived. I mean, Methuselah lived 969 years. I think Noah lived 950 years. I mean, these guys lived 900 plus years. I'm 52. And I don't expect to live past 100. <laughs> anyway, now, I don't know how long we're going to live. I mean, we might even make it to 60. Who knows? I mean, uh, hopefully we get raptured. We get raptured today. But I forgot what my point was. Anyway, Ezekiel <laughs> chapter 2. <laughs> we lived in a sin-cursed world. We don't live long like they did back then, yeah? And I'm kind of glad. I mean, if, if it's this bad for us at 50, 52, you know? <laughs> Anyway, they lived long back then. And do you know that it's going to revert back to that again in the millennial kingdom? Except they're going to live what? A thousand years. They're going to live a thousand years. The lion is going to lay... You know, I know we're not in the millennial kingdom right now. Because I've seen those videos where you got lions eating lambs. You know, those National Geographic or ones that they have about the nature... Those lions, they, I said, oh, we're not there yet. If you're not sure, try to type in, lion eats lamb. If he eats the lamb. Because in the millennial kingdom, it's not going to happen. It's going to be a different world. It's going to be a world that's not under the curse. The curse is going to be lifted. And so when Ezekiel sees this scroll, why is there lamentations, mourning, and woe if this is about the millennial kingdom? Because that's not the side he's looking at. He's looking at the other side. He's looking at the conditions that need to be met. He's looking at the tribulation period. And he sees what's going to happen. He says, When I looked, behold, and hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. That's not the millennial kingdom. In this scroll is going to be, it's going to talk about the millennial kingdom where we rule and reign with Jesus Christ, where there is going to be peace in the Middle East and every other place. So the information contained in the scroll that will happen in the future is chapters 19 through 22. Those chapters tell us about the marriage supper of the Lamb, the defeat of evil at the battle of Armageddon, Satan being bound a thousand years, and a thousand years of ruling and reigning with Christ, a description of the new Jerusalem. Have you ever study the description of the new Jerusalem and how beautiful it's going to be. The streets, I mean, we pave our streets with asphalt. In heaven, they pave the streets with gold. So when you wear gold, you're basically wearing asphalt in heaven. That's how much better heaven is. 
What we prize, they pave. We prize it as, how much is gold an ounce? <laughs> how much is asphalt an ounce? That's the difference. <laughs> Just that alone. The, the pearly gates, the size of the city. I forget when I studied it, how many earths could fit in the square footage of the new Jerusalem because of how tall it is and how many levels there, there could possibly be in it. It's going to be huge. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be awesome. So in this, in this scroll, it wasn't just that. In this scroll, we find the seven seal judgments, which contain the seven trumpet judgments, which also contain the seven bowl or vile judgments. This is the tribulation period, and he sees the mourning, the lamentation, and the woe. So we see the scroll in verse 1. Now we see in verse 2 through 4, the search. And I saw a strong angel. We don't know if this is Gabriel. We don't know if this is Michael. We don't know if this is another angel. We just know that he is strong. I wonder why he said strong. I wonder if he was like muscular. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Who is able to redeem the title deed? And no man in heaven, a search was made in heaven, no one. A search was made in earth, no one. Neither under the earth, not sure exactly what that means, but I don't know, searching for zombies or something? No. <laughs> No one in heaven, no one in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. No one could open up that scroll. They didn't have the authority. They weren't able to. No, there may, there may have been people that were willing or wanting to control the earth. There were people that wanted to be world rulers in the past, right? I mean, Hitler wanted to be. Charlemagne, or he wanted to be. You, you, you can think about Alexander the Great and all these uh, rulers of the past. They wanted to be, but they're not worthy. They might have been willing. They wanted the power. They wanted the power to rule. They want to be a world ruler. No one was found. No one was able to open the book. Just like how Jeremiah, it, it was his responsibility, and he had the right, the authority to redeem that property. No one was found worthy in all of heaven. And because no one was found worthy, John says in verse 4, he says, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And he wept much. That means that he sobbed uncontrollably. Who is worthy? Who has a divine right that would qualify him to break open the seals? Who has the power to defeat Satan and his demons, to wipe out sin and its effects, to reverse the curse of all of creation? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to. John says there was no one found in heaven. No angel is worthy. Some people say that Jesus is an angel. <laughs> He's not an angel. No angel is worthy to open the seals because none of them became human and paid the price, paid the perfect price of holiness for sin. Certainly there are billion of, billions of human souls in heaven, but every one of them had to be redeemed to be in heaven. There's no created being in heaven worthy to open the scroll. Even the cherubim, the elders, you know, the living creatures that surrounded the throne, they were not worthy. And on earth there was not found anyone worthy. Every single person on earth is condemned by sin and needs salvation provided by the Redeemer. And certainly the souls and demons of hell are not worthy. In all of the universe of God's created beings, there is found no one worthy to open the scroll and look into it. So John sobbed uncontrollably. He sobbed because everything he believed about redemption from sin and restoration for the people of God hinged on this one thing. 
He wanted to see Satan van vanquished and God's kingdom established on earth. He wanted to see Israel saved and Christ exalted. John knew that the Messiah had been executed, Jerusalem was destroyed, and the, and the Jewish people were massacred and scattered. He was well aware that the church faced intense persecution and was infected with sin. Everything seemed to be going badly. Would no one step forward to change this? Was no one going to unroll the scroll and redeem God's creation? Without someone who is worthy to open the scroll, there will be no in eternal inheritance for the believer. There will be no final defeat for sin and evil. There is, there is no hope without someone who is worthy. The scroll will remain sealed and judgment for sin and wickedness will take place. Without someone who is worthy, the scroll's content of the marriage supper of the Lamb, the eternal city and the new heaven and the new earth will not take place. John knew if no one was worthy, the hopelessness of our world in its present condition would go on indefinitely. All the suffering, pain, and death will never come to an end if no one is found worthy. Job, John wept for the failure to find a Redeemer meant that this earth in its curse is sentenced to death forever. And he sobbed. Just think of the fact of there not being any hope. See, we have hope. And our hope is in Jesus. Amen. No matter how discouraged it may seem down on this, uh, on this earth, we know we're going to be raptured. One day we're going to be with him in heaven for all of eternity. That's why Jesus said, and I believe he alludes to the rapture when he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, this is just like the way a Jewish wedding went. And it was, uh, it was a seven, se uh, they celebrated for, for um, seven days, a whole week. And then once that, that um, initial commitment was made and the, the bride price was paid and the commitments were made and the engagement period, the betrothal period happened, then the, bride, then, then the bridegroom, he would go to prepare the place. And the, um, the bride would wait and he would come for her at an unexpected time and meet her somewhere in the street somewhere out there. And then he would, he would meet her and take her to his father's house. And then they would celebrate. And then you would have the, the wedding celebration. And then, you would have the, then they would consummate the marriage. And so when it comes to us as being his bride, the price has already been paid. And he's preparing, he says, I'm, I'm preparing a place in heaven for you. And I will come again for you. So he's going to meet us somewhere in the air. <laughs> And then he says, and I will come again for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Paul said, comfort one another with these words, that there's going to be a shout, the voice of the archangel, the last trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together to be with him in the clouds. And then we shall ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. We, we have the hope and the comfort knowing that he's coming back for us. When John sees that there's no one worthy, he's weeping because if there was no one worthy, then there is no hope. And the sin-cursed world that he knew about, I mean, he was persecuted. He was placed in a, in a, a boiling pot of oil. They tried to kill him. They even gave him poison, but they just couldn't kill him. But he was exiled the, uh, on the island of Patmos. He's seen believers persecuted. They went through a lot. We may think that, wow, what's going on in our world? But imagine what was going on during John's time and what he's seen and what he experienced. So now he's in the throne room, and the question is, is there anyone worthy? And he weeps because without someone that's willing and worthy, there is no hope in this world. And the sin-cursed world that he experienced is going to continue on forever. And he wept and sobbed uncontrollably. Romans 8.22 says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And from the curse on, this, this creation has been groaning and travailing. Then we see the selection. So we see the scroll, the search, now the selection, verse 5 through 7. And one of the elders saith unto me, we believe that this is the church, the representative of the redeemed church. One of the elders saith unto me, 
this afternoon, we'll look at the song that they sing, and then you can easily tell who they are. <laughs> These elders are not angels. Anyway, one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. He said, don't be discouraged, John. There is one worthy. And John must have been elated to see that there is one worthy. Who is worthy? The lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David. These are messianic terms. In other words, these are terms that the Jews knew that meant, that spoke of, the Messiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and the root of David. So this goes back, the lion of the tribe of Judah, this goes back to Genesis chapter 49, verse 8 through 10. The root of David, this is in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and verse 10. These are messianic titles for Jesus Christ. So the lion of the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, verse 10 says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from be between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto, unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Shiloh is another name for Messiah. The scepter was a symbol of royal power. Lawgiver pertains to a legislator or one that is in authority. So the Bible says that the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now, that is one of the tribes, Judah. Now, this chapter, chapter 49 of Genesis, is when Jacob was giving out the blessings to his children. And so when he comes to Judah, he says this to that tribe. He says that the scepter shall not depart that means your authority in ruling, that you are going to be the tribe that rules. And the scepter will not depart from Judah until when? It's, or, and it says, nor a lawgiver, like a legislator, from between his feet. That's usually where the, the scepter was. His right to rule will not depart. Until when? Until Shiloh, or as the Jews say, Shiloh. Until Shiloh, until Shiloh comes. That's the Messiah. And then, of course, he's going to set up his throne, and he's going to rule and reign forever. So Judah will have that right to rule. This is the ruling tribe. So the scepter will not depart. The authority or the right to rule will not depart until the Messiah comes. So that's what, that's, they, they know that prophecy. So they took it to mean this, that their right to rule and to govern themselves, they will have that until the Messiah comes. And then when the Messiah comes, he will set up the kingdom and he'll rule from, from Jerusalem on the throne of David forever and ever and of his kingdom there'll be no end. So they always put their faith and trust in that. But one day, A.D. 12, something interesting happened. On A.D. 12, the Romans, because of some problems they're having with some Jews and for some skirmishes and some things that were going on, they decided to take away their authority to execute people. They would no longer have the authority to carry out capital punishment. That was in AD 12. That they would no longer have that authority. Now, the Jews felt like the authority to execute, they felt that that was the foundation of government. Because in, Gen in Genesis chapter 9, when Noah... And those that were with him, there was eight in the ark, Noah and seven others, Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives. When they came out of the ark, it was basically a new world. And God told them, after they, there were some changes that were made. They were supposed to eat meat. That's one of them. So be sure to eat meat. Red meat once a week, 
definitely guarantee. Don't be a vegetarian unless for stomach, you know, stomach can't handle meat or something. Even then, maybe you should just kind of like blend it or something. But we're supposed to eat meat. I can't explain all that right now, otherwise we're going to go past lunch. But at least, no need too much of it. You might get sore stomach or have stomach problems, but you should eat red meat at least once or twice a, meat, a, a week. Okay, that's another story, though. I can't get into all the reasons right now. Just, you just got to just, okay, let's. Once or twice a, a, a week. Okay. Anyway, another thing that was changed was God instituted government. He said, if man sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Man has the authority to put to death a murderer. God gave him that authority. That's the authority of government. So the authority of human government basically stems from the, the being willing or the authority to carry out capital punishment. So when Rome took away capital punishment from the Jews, they felt like their authority to rule was taken away. And on that day in the spring of AD 12, the rabbis went into the streets and rent their clothes and they mourned. They said, Woe unto us, for the scepter hath been taken away from Judah, and Shiloh has not come. And they mourned. The scepter is departed. He didn't come. And the Jewish historian Josephus wrote this. On that very day, in the temple, at the age of 12, was Jesus Christ debating with the scholars. And maybe he was talking about this situation. Shiloh hath come. In fact, he was sitting in their temple. And they're mourning and crying out and upset because he hath not come. And yet, he was right there under their nose. And they didn't even weren't even aware of it. Another interesting thing, you know, it says the root of David. Now, this means that the Messiah would be a direct descendant of David. Now, I don't have that much time to go into this, but Jesus Christ is a biological, blood-related descendant of David through the line of Nathan. From David's son, Nathan, he is a blood relative. He's related through the line of Mary. Now, if you were a descendant of David through the line of Solomon, there was a curse, the curse of Jeconiah that was placed upon Jeconiah, Coniah. He's called Jeconiah, he's called Coniah. There's a curse placed upon him that he would have no descendants that would rule on the throne. And he was cursed because of what he did concerning the word of God. But the Messiah is going to be a descendant of David, and his right to rule is going to be channeled through Solomon. It says that, that Solomon was the one that through his line would come forth the Messiah and given his right to rule. The Bible also says that the Messiah has to be a blood relative of David. How is that going to work if there's a curse? So what happens? The virgin birth. So through the virgin birth, and there is two major qualifications I don't have time to get into. To make a long story short, that Jesus Christ had to get his authority through all the way down to David through Solomon to rule. But he had to be a blood relative. But if he was a blood relative through Solomon, he'd go through Kaniah, and he would have been cursed. So the blood relation goes through all the way to David through Nathan as a blood relation. But his authority to rule is traced to Solomon through adoption because of the virgin birth. So he is the root of David. And there's a lot more to, to say about that. But just to say this, 
that he was the root of David. He comes from David. He was a, a relative of David, and yet he is to rule over David. Now, how is that going to work? He comes from David, but yet he's before David. How can Jesus come from David and yet be before David? Because he was always there. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here you have Jesus Christ that they crucified, and yet he is the Messiah that they were waiting for and looking for and hoping for. I'll close with this. What says in verse 6, And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, having authority and all knowledge, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came, and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So when he took that scroll, all the time frame of everyone saying, how long? This is it. Once he took that scroll, now, what's going to happen? The conditions are going to have to be made. The earth is going to have to go through this tribulation period in order for everything to be finished and finalized at the last thing that's going to happen, which would be the battle of Armageddon. And then he is going to set up his throne and redemption of the earth will already have been completed. In John chapter 19, verse 17 through 30, I want to close with this, just look there. They were waiting for their Messiah. They were looking for their Messiah, and yet he was right there in the temple. They crucified their Messiah. They were waiting for him, and yet they crucified him and didn't even know who he is. In John chapter 19, verse 17 through 30, it says, And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the in the Hebrew, Golgotha. When they crucified him and two other with him on either side, on either side one and Jesus in the midst, Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. The writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Greek, and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Now the whole time through all of this, Pilate was concerned about appeasing the Jews. He felt pressured. He even said that, the blood be upon you. And he didn't really want to do this. But he always seemed to kind of cater to the Jews to keep the peace. But not this time. They said, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. All right. Did he say that because he was mad at them? Did he say that because he knew something they did not? Did he say that because just God made him say that? God has been in control the whole time. In crucifixion, it was common for Rome to write the crime for which the man was dying, the crime for which he was dying over his head. Why? What was his crime? In Jesus' case, as we read, the writing was Jesus of Nazareth. Now, if you ever saw a picture of a crucifixion or a crucifix, you always see written over the head of Jesus on the cross the letters I-N-R-I. Has anyone ever seen that? I-N-R-I. -I, you're wondering, what is that? See, because they didn't have space to write all of the, everything, they would just write the first letters of the words. So it was written in three languages, right? It was written in Latin. It was written in Greek. And it was written in Hebrew for the Jews, you know, for the Romans, and in the language that was spoken by most everyone in Greek. So everyone could see. So when you read it in Latin, the, the letters I-N-R-I, -I, it's Latin for 
Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And it's I because that's how in Latin you said Jesus. And I, I have it down there in the notes. But that's the, the letters, I-N-R-I. But it was also written in Greek, and then it was written in Hebrew. When they wrote it in Hebrew, this is what you have. Yeshua ha Nazareth, Vlekem ha Yehudim. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Y-H-V-H. -H. And in Hebrew, just like Hawaiian, the, the W and the V can be interchangeable. It's Y-H-W-H. -H. That's, it's called a te, uh, tedroctolam, I forget how you say it. Well, what that means is it's four letters for Yahweh. Yahweh is the name for God. When God told Moses to send him to Pharaoh, and he told him, just tell him that I am sent you. The word I am, that means I am that I am. I am the self-existent one. I am the eternal one. I am the God of the past, the God of the present, the God of the future. I am who you need. Whatever you need, I am that. I am Yahweh. The Jews never pronounce it, so they just listed it as letters, Y-H-W-H, -H, and it was so sacred. They never pronounced it. That's why there was no vowels to it. Then when they did put vowels to it, they came up with Jehovah. Some still say, some today say, don't say Jehovah. They say Yahweh. Most of the Jews will say Yahweh. That is their God. That is God. That is Jehovah God. So when he's crucified, they looked up at the cross and they saw Yahweh. And they said, don't put Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews, because it comes up Yahweh. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. Why? Just like the fact that Jesus was there sitting in the temple, right under their nose, and they're crying out that the Messiah had not come, but he had come. They just didn't recognize him. And here they crucify the one that they were waiting for. And he told them that he is Lord. And they, they rejected him and they crucified him. And there it was, right there for everybody to see Yahweh. And they missed it. Sometimes you and I can be crying out and complaining, not knowing, and thinking, where is he? Where is Jesus when I need him? Where is he during this time of COVID and pandemic and mandates and lockdowns? Where is he? He's right under our noses. He's right there with us. He's in control, and he says this, that we can boldly approach his throne to find grace to help in the time of need. Just like the Jews who are mourning in the streets and crying out and, and upset and probably distressed and feeling hopeless, and he's right in the temple. And they crucify him, and there's a sign right there. I mean, do you know what they would ask for too? They said what? Just give us a sign. And we'll believe. And there's a sign right there. Sometimes we want to, Lord, just give me a sign. How do I know that you love me? How, that you know, how do I know that you care about me? How do I know? Just give me a sign. And we're looking right at the cross. <laughs> what other sign do we need? How do we know that Jesus loves us? Because he says, I love you this much. And he died on the cross for us. We may have we may have a disease, we may have cancer, we may lose our job, we may have to be persecuted, we may go through trials, but no matter what we go through, He's still been gracious to us because of the cross. And if He doesn't do anything, if we can't recognize any blessing in our life, all we have to do is look at the cross and we know it's all good. Because we're going to heaven. We may go around the streets renting our clothes, so to speak. Crying out, oh, everything is so terrible. And yet, we forget to think that there's a sign that tells us that Yahweh is with us. The creator of the universe, he's right there with us. 
He says, Lord, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And even though we who are sinful creatures, even after we get saved, we're sinners by nature, choice, and practice, and now we are righteous in his eyes positionally, but practically sometimes we do some strange things. He still loves us, and he's going to take us to heaven no matter what. Not because of our works, but because of his work on the cross. If you've never trusted Christ, I encourage you to trust Jesus Christ before it's eternally too late. I need a sign right here. Did you say, we need a sign, Yahweh, right there. On and they crucified him. Now, we are living in probably, a, you know, one of the most interesting times in a long time in our, in the existence of this country. But you know what? He's not left his throne. He's still ruling and reigning. He's not stressed out about anything. And when we do get stressed out, James says, if it, are any of you afflicted? Let him what? Pray. We can go through the throne of grace and find grace to help in a time of need because he is in control. Here they're crying out in the streets and he's in the temple <laughs> talking to them about who he is. And he told them, I and the Father are one. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's the one on the throne and we'll see he will be worshipped, and we'll look at that, the, rest, the, the remainder part of this passage. Would you bow our heads and close your eyes? You have been listening to our Truth to Live By podcast, a ministry of Windward Baptist Church. This podcast is supported by the gifts and donations of its listeners. You can make a secure donation through our website at windwardbaptist.org.